<laughs> dog. <laughs> He's got a dog. Being close to this. Puppy dog was out of class too. <laughs> I'm going to open up the quiz. <laughs> Here we go. All right, let me share my screen. How's everyone doing? Mm. Tired. So far, so good. <laughs> I know. I just, I just rolled out of bed myself. Uh, it, it's like it came fast. It's like ah. <laughs> um. Let me share my screen. For some reason, my um, this is Cindy Carranza. My um, Wi-Fi is not working, so I can't see the screen. I'm only on my phone. Okay, I um on the call. All right, I I hit record already, so um, okay. I think thanks. we're I think we're good there. Yeah, thanks for uh, telling me. <clears throat> okay. Can you guys see this quiz? Oh yeah, you're yes. on. You're on. I'm um, sorry. Keep forgetting you're on mute. All right. Thanks. Mammary glands. PRL. Prolactin. The second messenger was cyclic AMP. Mm -hmm. And releasing inhibiting hormones are made by the hypothalamus. And they're going to control the anterior pituitary. That's actually in, that's actually one of the, I think that's in question nine. Because I asked you, like, what are the, Hormones of the anterior pituitary and the releasing hormones. I don't know. But anyway. Right. Um, paracrines, they act close by. So neighboring cells. Mm -hmm. Most of you guys got all these right. Um, posterior pituitary, oxytocin and ADH. HDH, somatotroph. Somato means like kind of like growth. Some people miss this one. Opposing each other is antagonistic. Yeah. Oh, so is this, this is too small? Let me see. Hold on, I'm going to stop and I'm going to start again. Your entire screen. So, um, I want you guys to be able to see like a full screen is are you guys seeing a full screen or is it small uh, I think it's like normal I'm trying to figure out if it's just you the person I can enlarge there we go. It looks okay. Yeah. April, it's look there there should be a way to make it larger. Yeah, I just pressed the large but the green button to make it large. The green button to make it large. Okay. 
you know, maximize. Oh, and yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> upper left. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm an old person, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't know if it has a name. I just. <laughs> All right. Hormones opposing each other is antagonistic. Working together, mm -hmm. synergy, synergistic. Um. Okay, here we are. Now we're at the hard questions. So I think almost, I think all of you got the lipid soluble fine. You know, I, I was looking for something about going into the, um, going into the nucleus, you know, changing the DNA, um, changing genetic expression. And then water soluble, um, that's where some of you miss stuff. You know, I was looking for, you know, be complete. I was looking for the, steps i wanted you to talk about the g protein and adenylylcyclase converting atp into camp the whole thing camp is going to go and um activate protein kinases which in turn phosphorylate other enzymes and it's those enzymes that are going to ultimately change the behavior of the cell there's a little bit more. There was just details that were missing. Then for question nine, y'all, I think everyone listed the hormones of the anterior pituitary, those seven hormones. Some of you didn't really didn't talk about the releasing hormones, but instead maybe you listed the cells or you didn't read the question all the way. And you just listed the hormones of the anterior pituitary and you just stopped there. All right. But there was also releasing hormones that are responsible, you know, for, for example, um, CRH causes the release of ACTH and, and MSH or um, GNRH causes the release of um, LH and FSH. So most everybody got, the last one, right, too. Um, ADH is found, it'd be tempted to say kidneys, but um, it's actually made by, so I didn't count this, but technically it's made by the hypothalamus. It's stored in the posterior pituitary. And then how it works, it goes down to the kidneys and tells the kidneys to conserve water, you know, not use it in the production of urine. So... Um, some of you had problems with the um, time, it being timed. Um, oh, we talked about that already. I said I was going to add a little bit of time, but if we, if I start using the lockdown browser, then um, I'll put a lot of time, you know, hours. You'll have all the time you need. Um, does anyone have any questions on these test questions? Right. <coughs> Let me open up that endocrine slide first. There was one more thing on the endocrine system I wanted to talk about which I already deleted the PowerPoint. That was stupid of me. All right. I think it was like the last slide. This one, yeah. Okay. So the pancreas, we're gonna talk about the pancreas two times, one time in um, the digestive system, one time in the endocrine system. So the, the pancreas is exocrine and endocrine, meaning that it makes hormones that it puts into the blood, but it also makes enzymes that it secretes through a duct. And that's gonna be the digestive system. So um, for us hormones, 
And so the hormones that it makes, there's four. It, two of them people remember, and the other two people often forget. So the first hormone is insulin. And insulin, as we know, lowers blood sugar. So, uh, no, I'll put it. Glucose lowers blood glucose. Um, by, because really, like, what does that mean? How does it lower? Um, so. creating something called glycogen if it's with a G so your body has sugar in two forms you have a um, you have a, um, a storage form and then you have it kind of freely flowing through the blood so um, glycogen is like blood sugar but it's stored in your liver and muscles and then so okay let's say like um i put sugar in my coffee which i didn't but let's say i put a bunch of sugar in my coffee right and then i drink that coffee that sugar is gonna pretty quickly end up in my blood and so let's say i keep drinking that like i keep taking in sugar um my blood sugar is going to start to go up right because the sugar is getting absorbed into my blood in the blood, we're going to call it glucose. So anyway, my blood glucose goes up. And so um, I got to get it down, right? It can't go too high. I need blood sugar because I need to use that for energy. But it's about the extra sugar levels go up. And so insulin gets released by the pancreas. Then what's going to happen with all that sugar? It's not like you're going to pee it out or something. We hold on to it. We store it as glycogen. So um, I think of it like sugar granules would be like glucose in your blood. A sugar cube would be glycogen in your liver and your muscles. Okay. And then you don't eat anything for a few hours, right? Now it's 1130. Um, you haven't eaten anything. Your blood sugar starts to go down. Right, so you be, you start to get hypoglycemic. Now you're going to release another hormone called um, glucagon, and glucagon raises blood sugar. By by breaking up glycogen. Want to get it on one line. So you're constantly going back and forth. You're constantly creating glycogen and you're constantly breaking up glycogen. Like your glycogen stores will probably last you for a day and then you'll run out, <coughs> right? And then, then you're going to be hypoglycemic um, and you know, you'd be lightheaded and stuff like that. So we usually try to keep your blood glucose levels. Everybody has different numbers, but they're all somewhere around 100. 90 to 110, 90 to 100, 80 to 100. There's, there's different opinions, right? Um, definitely when it gets below 80, that's not good. You know, and definitely if I see CBG like 150, that would be bad. I've seen it many times in New Orleans so high that it... Um, the meter, the glucometer can't read it. it. Just says high, you know, over 500, right? Um, so you you want to keep a normal level somewhere around 100, and so um, that's what these two hormones do: insulin and glucagon. They're constantly being released to uh, create this homeostasis. Um, you have two other hormones that are made in your pancreas as well. There are these cells called the pancreatic islets or islets of Langerhans, if, if you're reading about it in the book. I mean, I don't care so much about the names of the cells. Um, <clears throat> so 
Should I answer him like right in front of everyone? No, I can't. I have to get on my phone. I, I don't want to do any FERPA violations. Someone's trying to get into our class. Um, so we have two other hormones that um, the code is not working. No code worked for you guys. Check the announcements. The one I put up yesterday has it. Um, so there's two other hormones. One is, um, wow, somatostatin. That actually is another name for growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So somatostatin can inhibit the other two. And then the last one we have is called um, pancreatic polypeptide that causes the release of um, digestive enzymes. So that's the four hormones of the pancreas. You'll read a lot about cells. The books spend a lot of time talking about, um, here we go, talking about uh, different cells. Um, I don't know why, you know, the beta cells are where insulin is made from. I probably won't ask you that on a test. You know, I'm just going to ask you what I put here for the four hormones, right? And really, in, in reality, you're going to see insulin and glucagon being discussed the most, right? Especially insulin, right? Because that's uh, it's like our state disease, <clears throat> type 2 diabetes. All right, so that was the thing on the pancreas that I wanted to talk to you about, and that's what this slide is um, showing you. It's saying what glucagon does. Glucagon raises blood sugar. Insulin, insulin lowers blood sugar. So um, you don't, as far as I'm concerned, you don't need to know all these. Um, you don't have to know all these details. So. Let me minimize that. Any questions on that? I'm about to go into blood. So I'm going to do some blood. If you guys can stop me at like 1050, that would be nice if I don't stop myself. And because um, I'd like to talk about some things that I want you to study for exam one. So right, let me open up the blood. So this is blood. You have about um, you have about four to five liters of blood in your body. Ismail, Dude, my son drank, made a pot of coffee, like four cups of coffee, just to bring out here. He used all of it, but like that little tiny bit for some coffee drink bring me some more very important um blood's about four to five liters how much you should have um like a good idea about what a liter is and what 500 milliliters are this is a little off topic but um a water bottle an average water bottle is about 500 milliliters or in other words half of a liter Right, so there's a thousand milliliters in one liter. Water bottle is about half a liter. That's also like an IV bag is about half a liter or 500 mils. Um, two liter bottle that can give you an idea of what two liters are. Actually, they sell liter bottles now, so that can give you a good idea about how much a liter is. Right. So everything when we talk about things in anatomy, it's all using the metric system: grams, kilograms liters, milliliters, things like that. So Celsius, um, so four to five liters of blood, right? Um, men have a little bit more, women have a little bit 
less. You know, women are closer to four, men are on average are closer to five liters. But to give you about how much idea, an idea about how much blood's in our body. Um, you should know the pH of blood, and I didn't put that on here. I'll have to make a slide. It's 7.4. So seven is neutral. And then generally above seven, we would call it alkaline or basic, and below seven would be acidic. Blood is a little bit alkaline. When we talk about blood, though, it's 7.4, and it cannot move very much on either side of that 7.4. So 7.35 to 7.45. Um, it has very little variance, right? Your blood really, I mean, your body really keeps that pH right at 7.4. <clears throat> so if we were to have a blood pH of 7.3, we would call that acidic, acidosis. But you'd be saying, well, no, that's above seven. That's definitely not an acid, right? But for with blood, our our balance is 7.4 so below 7.4 like 7 that would be very um acidic all right so anyway um yeah that's all right so three things in no let's use this so blood is mostly water right so we have two different parts of blood we have formed elements the formed elements are like the things that are floating in the fluid. And then we have, um, we have like uh, plasma. So let's look at plasma and then let's look at these formed elements. So um, blood is about 55% plasma, 45% formed elements. In fact, we have, a, there's a lab reading called um, hematocrit, and that um, that measures the amount of formed elements in your blood. So hematocrit should be around 45, right, because the formed elements are about 45%, right? So hematocrit is saying how much your blood is not plasma. So, so let's go back to plasma. Plasma is mostly water. So as you see here, about 92% water. Um, and most of the rest of it are plasma proteins. And there's three plasma proteins mentioned here. And I made another slide with these plasma proteins. Actually, let me just go to it. There's plasma proteins. Fibrinogen, or sometimes they call it fibrinogen. That's going to be involved in clotting. Notice this O-G-E-N. We did that last class. We had a word with O-G-E-N. Um, so that means, if you remember, it's inactive. Good. You want it inactive. You don't want to be making clots. So fibrinogen is an inactive um, form of fibrin, which is going to be involved in making clots. Globulins later on in the semester, we're going to call them immunoglobulins. They're going to be involved in immunity. Albumin is used for transporting um, a few things. It transports some gases like um, carbon dioxide, but it's also, um, it has a big role in transporting water. So how do we get water out of your capillaries or into your capillaries? Like how do we move water out of your blood or into your blood? Um, albumin has an important role in that. So those are your three plasma proteins. And then you got some other stuff in there. All right, but plasma is mainly water, and there's some plasma proteins in there. And then we're left down here with formed elements. So red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. And then we call them by their, their names. Site means cell, so that's general. And then erythro is red, and leuco is white. And thrombo means um, platelets or clots. They, the, the word's kind of used in other things. You'll see these words in, in the subsequent slide. But, 
sites. So I'm looking, I'm looking here in the middle. You have erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes. <coughs> and you'll notice that um, the vast majority of your blood of the formed elements are red blood cells. So, um, shut my phone off. Um, all right, let me go into each one. So we're going to talk about each one. So that's just kind of a electron microscopy of it. Um, you can see the red blood cells. They're what we call biconcave. So they're round and then they're kind of caved in in the middle. <clears throat> um, there's little platelets. Platelets are not cells. They're actually pieces of, of a cell. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then here's white blood cells. So let's look at red blood cells. All right, so I left this slide from a previous class because, um, actually I like it because I erased a bunch of stuff that I didn't want to talk about with you. <coughs> and so um, I just left it off. This is all the blood cells actually. So this right here at the bottom, that's a red blood cell. This is a platelet. And then we have a bunch of white blood cells. We'll talk about that in a minute. So right now we're just concentrating on what I circled in red. But I would like you to see that they all come from stem cells, right? So a, a pluripotent stem cell has the ability to differentiate, to become many other different types of stem cells. You know, it's like the stem cells that they talk about in the media and stuff. So. Um, so with blood, you see that the pluripotent stem cell becomes two different types of stem cells, myeloid, and then over here you see lymphoid. Um, so you notice that the lymphoid over here is kind of different. Like, like here's white blood cells. There's one, two, three, four. I'm going to put these two together, five. <coughs> but something's different about the lymphoid. And so you'll see that in a later chapter. But anyway, let's follow this. Let's stay in the red. Let me stay in the red. So the pluripotent stem cell ends up becoming this cell called a erythroblast, pro-erythroblast. That's going to become a cell called a reticulocyte. And I want you to notice here that the nucleus gets ejected right so red blood cells do not have a nucleus so all the other cells in our body have nuclei red blood cells do not have a nucleus so they need to be made and then they die so it's not like our other blood cell i mean our other cells where they can just uh go through mitosis and you know, one cell becomes two and two become four. It's not like that. So they have to be made. And so you'll notice here in blue, I put erythropoietin increases this, proerythroblast. So that's something that is common to see in hospitals, right? So if you come in with a low hematocrit, Right, so I'm expecting hematocrit to be somewhere around 45, right? Meaning that 45% of your blood is red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, right? And so I'm expecting that number to be about 45. A little more for men, it could be up to 47. For women, like um, 43. But it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be 28. You know, it shouldn't be 35. It's too low. Right. And so what you can do is you can give erythropoietin. Poietin, you can view that word to mean increase. So it increases <coughs> red blood cells. And that's a way to get your, because red blood cells are carrying oxygen. So you don't want, um, you know, you, know, you want a lot of red blood cells because that's what they do. In fact, that's what people dope with. Like Lance Armstrong, he was taking uh, erythropoietin. That gives him more red blood cells therefore more oxygen carrying capacity, right? So, um, yeah. 
So um, in the hospitals, they'll call it like um, Epigen. You'll come across it. It's very common. Right? It's a common thing for people to give. So Epigen is actually um, erythropoietin. Um, and then you see another word I have down there in blue called thrombopoietin. So that's thrombo means, yes, for those of you that answered it, platelets, right? So, well, I have it marked platelets. Thrombopoietin increases, um, increases the amount of platelets that are being made. That, that, that's common too. So, um, so that's red blood cells. Look at platelets here. You'll notice that, that they were a cell called a megakaryocyte. So megakaryocytes, it's a cell, and then it become it, it gets splintered into like two to three thousand pieces of cells. And those are going to be used to, for, um, to you know, to plug a um, a hole in the capillary. They're used to make platelet plugs. We'll talk about that. And then, um, then these are all white blood cells. But let's let's go back to red blood cells. So, no nucleus. They have to be made. And they have to be, um, and and they die. Um, red blood cells are essentially all they really are are just masses of hemoglobin and i made a mistake here and i don't care about you memorizing this number i was just trying to tell you this this means around approximately 280 million you have to put the word million big difference so each red blood cell is just masses of of hemoglobin molecules and each hemoglobin molecule can carry um for oxygen molecules, right? And so I cross this out because it gets really confusing, but hemoglobin, what you can see in the middle here is that it's iron, right? Iron is an important component of hemoglobin. <clears throat> hemoglobin, the molecule is made from two things right here, heme and globin, hence the name hemoglobin. So globin's a protein, heme, is as i wrote here a pigment with iron that's it that's what hemoglobin is that's what your blood is your blood is made of protein iron pigment so three components that make up your red blood cells protein called globin iron and um a pigment so um that's it I know this looks really bad, and I wrote on it because I thought that it wasn't confusing enough. Uh, but if, you know what? I'm we're gonna take this. I'm gonna make a new slide, and we're gonna break it down and make it easier. So let me um, new slide. Okay. So. Um, blood cells, red blood cells are RBC, no, RBC, red blood cells are made in the red bone marrow. Can you find red bone marrow in long bones, um, flat bones? So like your humerus, your femur, that's where you find, um, red blood cells. Right. They live for about, can you tell us not to bring my coffee to me? No, that's no, sorry. Sorry, I know. It's so, black. Okay, red blood cells live for about 120 days. They're phagocytized in the um, liver and spleen. So what does phagocytized mean? It means, if, I don't know if you remember, but a phagocyte is a cell that like engulfs things and, eat it, and eats it. Like a 
Pac-Man for those older students. So phagocytized, we use that as a verb. It just means to eat something, right? So you, it, your red blood cells are removed by your red bone marrow. They live for a month. And then at the end of that lifespan, your liver and your spleen eat them up, phagocytize them, break them down. So they get all broken down. And we can recycle some of this. And some of this we can um, not recycle. We can recycle the, the protein and the iron. So um, let's start about the let's start with the protein first. All right. This is really important, so I'm sorry to thank you. Let's talk about the protein first. The protein protein is like um, glass, you know, like as far as getting recycled, it's like a great thing to get recycled. It's really easy. It gets recycled almost a hundred percent. So I'm just putting protein for the globin. Gets recycled. Proteins in your body, all proteins, they're constantly getting broken down by your body and then turned into other proteins by your body. So I, I view proteins as being like chains, and those chains are made of links. And when we don't want to use a protein anymore, we break all the links up. And so it's no longer a chain, but we keep the links, and you can take them and hook them back together to make different proteins. Right? So in this case, we can use the globin over again and make more, um, more blood cells. This point, globin gets recycled, period. Now we're stuck with the iron. The iron is also going to get recycled, but um, you're also eating iron. So we're getting iron from like dead red blood cells, but uh, we're also getting it from food. So first things first, we got to take this iron from the liver and the um, spleen. We got to take it all and we got to transport it to a temporary holding site. So there's going to be a um, there's going to be a, a protein that does that, and we call that transferrin. So trans meaning transport, ferrin F E R R is always going to tell you iron. So transferrin transports it, and it's going to hold it into like a temporary storage site. And that temporary storage site is called ferritin. So transferrin picks it up. Transferrin is a, a transport protein. It stores it in a storage protein called ferritin. And so in ferritin, you're getting ironed from um, your red blood cells, your dead red blood cells. But you're also getting iron from food. So, we're, you know, your body's collecting a bunch of iron. And then once you got like a good amount of iron, ferritin is going to, transferrin is going to come by and pick it up again. And um, it's going to deliver it to your red bone marrow. So oh, what happens to the iron in your old, worn out red blood cell? Transferrin picks it up, brings it over to ferritin. And I'll hold it there for a while and then come pick it up later and bring it over to the red bone marrow. That's what happens to iron. So, so far, not too bad. Protein gets recycled. Iron's going to get recycled. Transferrin's going to pick it up, hold it as ferritin, and then pick it up again and bring it to the red bone marrow where it's going to be used to make new red blood cells. Now we're stuck with the pigment. Pigment is not pigment is not recycled, so that's a waste. And so first, there's going to be a pigment called um, biliverdin, and then it's going to become a pigment called bilirubin. Bilirubin is a pigment that you'll see when you do um, like lab tests. That's a common um, like liver liver function. So bilirubin is, well, actually, I've got it in another, in another slide. So bilirubin, that's going to be 
the first pigment that we are discussing. Billy Rubin is going to get converted to an, um, another um, pigment called um, Euro. I've got it right here. Eurobalinogen. Look, I'm right here. Billy Rubin. Billy Rubin is going to be converted to Eurobalinogen. And Eurobalinogen, if you kind of follow it along, let's follow the Billy Rubin first. That's liver. Then liver, from the liver, um, your liver makes something called bile. And bile is going to end up in your intestine. It breaks down fat. That's what bile does. But the bilirubin gets put into it. So this pigment is going to end up in your intestine. And it turns into something called urobilinogen. I know it's like a horrible word. Urobilinogen is going to be broken down in two different places. Um, one, it's going to stay in the intestine. And in that case, it's going to become stercobilin. That's going to color your feces. I put feces there. Remember, it's coloring your feces. It's not, it's not your feces. Right? And then the other one goes to your kidneys, and it's going to be turned into um, urobilin. So like urine, and that's going to color your urine. So that gives your urine the yellow color. And that gives your feces the brown color. And that's going to give your bile like a yellowish, greenish color. Not that we ever see the color of that, but, you know, your, um, that's what happens to the, the pigment. So let's follow it here. <clears throat> I've circled here in black what happens to the proteins. You know, in the previous slide, I said protein globin gets recycled. That's all I wrote. Same thing here. So here's the red blood cell that's dead. You notice that it's been broken up into heme and globin. Globin's getting recycled and reused to make new proteins. That's done. The iron, here's the heme. The heme gets broken down into iron. That's this arrow here. So iron gets picked up by transferrin. We're going to store it as ferritin. Transferrin is going to pick it back up again and bring it to the red bone marrow. So that's what that is. Just like I wrote in this previous slide. So here's the iron part. So iron gets picked up by transferrin, held as ferritin picked up again by transparent, taken to the red bone marrow. And uh, that's it. Now we are on the hardest part, the pigment part. There is Billy Veridin, which I didn't put on the slide, which you, know, you can skip. There's Billy Rubin. So here's the Billy Rubin in the liver. It becomes um, urobilinogen. The urobilinogen is going to break up. So it's going to break up into stercobilin, which is going to stay in your intestines and color your feces. Or some of that is going to go to your kidneys, urobilin, and that's going to become urine. I know that's a lot of stuff that's not fun. Oh, and then I put up here an elevated level of bilirubin. Hemo meaning blood. There's that word lysis again, meaning breakdown. Right? So maybe your blood cells are breaking up too much, more than we would uh, expect. Right? So uh, you could have a low hematocrit, meaning that you don't have a lot of red blood cells. And then you could look at the bilirubin and see that that's high. And so then you could say something. You could be like, okay, well, this person has low hematocrit and they're not carrying oxygen around like they should because for some reason they have hemolysis, like their red blood cells are breaking up. 
you know, so why is that happening? <clears throat> Just trying to give you like a practical um, use for what you're learning so far. So that is, uh, oh, wow. Really? I really wanted to get through this. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> the last thing, because I see I'm out of time, is the rate book. That might bring me to 10.52, and then I'll talk about the test. White blood cells are, are used in immunity. White blood cells do have a nucleus. In fact, we use that nucleus to kind of um, see different, like to know what different white cells are. You know what? In today's world, it doesn't matter. Um, back in like even the 90s, I had to take the white blood cells and like look at them under a microscope and I had to like count them. Not everything, but I would count them in a square. So we'd put them on a special slide and it'd be like a square and you'd pick random squares and count how many white blood cells are in them. And then you can get a, a white blood cell count that way. Now, any clinic has a, they just drop it in a machine and it spits it right out, which is good. Different white blood cells tell you there's five different types of white blood cells and they're all right here, right? Acenophil, basophil, neutrophil. And actually these, You'll notice in, in biology, those microscope slides, if you ever have to look at them, you got spared this semester, so good for you. They're, um, they're colors of like blue and red and purple. And that's because of the, there's these different staining agents that they use. Um, so one's called eosin, that's why you get this word, acenophil. And then um, the other one's called hematoxylin. Um, but, um, one stains acidic things and one stains basic things. And then neutrophils are not, they tend to not be either. That's why they're like, they're more purple. So if you look at acenophils under a microscope, they tend to be like red. And anyway, um, I shouldn't have wasted time on that. In fact, we used to call them granular and agranular. Um, I don't know if people are doing that anymore, but all that means is like when you look at it, you can see it look kind of grainy. Um, and these don't tend not to look kind of grainy. But what I want you to know from this is, A, I want you to know how many uh, white blood cells are in a, um, are in a um, microliter of blood. About five, ten thousand white blood cells. So if you have too many white blood cells, they call it leukocytosis. If you don't have enough white blood cells, they call it leukopenia. So P-E-N-I-A -E means like under, like less than. So anyway, this stuff that I wrote in black, the seno high levels of xenophils might indicate a parasitic infection, just like it's written here, right? So high levels mean something. Low levels also mean something. I didn't want you to memorize all of it, so we're just kind of going with like elevated. And the main two that you that you'll see the most often are neutrophils and lymphocytes. Lymphocytes have like a nice round nucleus like this. Um, they're high in viral infections, and neutrophil are high in bacterial infections. People that, when, when we get sick, we can get sick with lots of things. But as far as like pathogens, it's most likely going to be bacterial or viral. So if you have pneumonia, that's what you're thinking. Is it a bacteria or is it a virus? And that means something because if it's a bacteria, if it's bacterial pneumonia, maybe you could give something, you know, um, antibiotics. If it's viral, not really, as you are now learning saying whatever they're saying for chloroquine it's not you know maybe maybe not anyway that's white blood cells so the the test does anyone have any questions so far so i'm going to talk about what's on the what's going to be on uh what i want you to focus on for exam one
this. I want you to know this might be an open end. This would be an open ended. This could be one of the open ended questions. You know, what are the five types of leukocytes and what would a high level indicate? And so you should know this slide, which means you have to learn how to spell eosinophil and basophil and neutrophil, lymphocyte and monocyte. Oh, sorry, TB stands for tuberculosis, which is technically a bacteria. So um, I want you to know that. I want you to be able to say this, to talk it out. So it doesn't, like, this is really confusing. I get it. I don't want you to put arrows like I put. I'm being lazy. I want you to talk it out. So what is the fate of red blood cells? How long do they live? They live 120 days. What happens to them after they die, quote unquote die? Um, well, they get broken down. Protein gets recycled and the iron gets recycled. And just say that, you know, gets picked up by transferrin, taken to ferritin, and it's eventually gonna be brought back to the red bone marrow. And then I want you to talk about um, what happens to the pigment that is not recycled, broken down into bilirubin, then urobilinogen, then stercobilin, which is going to end up in your feces, urobilin, which is going to end up in your urine. Um, sentences, let's step it up a little bit and, and type it out as, um, as sentences. I'll make sure to give you enough time. but. You already know that I'm going to ask you a question about red blood cells. I'm going to ask you a question about white blood cells. So you can practice answering them now. You know, what what happens to red blood cells when they when they die? You know, explain it. Um, explain the different types of blood cells and what a high level of them might indicate. Um, what are the three plasma proteins? So you should know that too. I don't know if I'm going to put that as a short answer or as a multiple choice. I haven't figured it out yet. Um, how much of your blood is... You should know what hematocrit is. I didn't write it on here, but hematocrit should be somewhere around 45. Um, yeah, so we didn't talk anything about um platelets thrombocytes right so none of that's going to be on the test um let me go and open that endocrine one yes what are the hormones of the pancreas what do they do i don't care about the cells that made them i just want to know what they do two of them you're going to know insulin and glucagon um, I missed it. What was the RVC numbers high and low? Red blood cell or RBC? Um, yeah, that slide, it has it in black. And so it says like under where you see neutrophil, it'll say like an arrow going up and say bacteria, right? So a high level of neutrophil indicates a bacterial infection. I don't have anything for low numbers. I mean, there are, but I didn't, you know, you're welcome to put it, but I didn't put it on this slide. Yes. Yes, on the pancreatic hormones and what they do. I would like you to know what epinephrine does. Epinephrine, norepinephrine. Increases your heart rate, breaks up fat to make more ATP. Breaks up glycogen to make more blood glucose for ATP. I want you to know what steroids do. I mean, I got them listed here. Right. Um, 
definitely this. I'll probably say explain the renin angiotensin process. Right. And um, yeah. Or I don't know, maybe I'll say something like lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor. You know, lisinopril. So how, how does it work? I mean, you know how it works. ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. So if you stop that, you know, then I want you to be complete. Then you stop production of angiotensin 2, which means you stop the production of aldosterone. So here I put arrows. You, I would like you to um, write it out, be complete. Sentences. I like sentences. Um, so what it means is that, you know, just sit with it and, and, and learn it if you haven't already. Sit with it and learn what it's about. And there's videos that just talk about this process. If you type in ren and angiotensin aldosterone in YouTube, you're going to find it. Um, I'm not going to ask you. So, yeah, I'll ask you the function of, of, function of steroids. I'm going to ask you about um, ren and angiotensin aldosterone. I will not ask you about this one down here, androgens. <clears throat> um, you should know what PTH does, what calcitonin does. Um, you know, PTH raises um, blood calcium. Calcitonin lowers blood calcium. Hmm. Last question that I could possibly ask, like of big question on is um, how thyroid hormones are made. Again, like, you know, you have two choices here. One, go look in your book and write down every sentence. Or two, work it out in your head and just try to explain it. And you're going to miss some big words. I'm fine with that. I don't mind that. Like, I'm always, when I'm reading these things, I'm trying to figure out, do you really know that in your head? Or did you just memorize to regurgitate? If you know it, if I could tell that you know it and you were just unclear on something, I'm more likely to just make a comment but not take any points off of it, right? Because, I mean, you know, you know it. And I know, and I know you'll get the big idea of it. But if you, if you come in and you're like, whatever this stuff is saying, I died trapping synthesis of TG, you, you don't know what it is. You just memorized a bunch of words. Like, that's how I would have approached it, too. Right? But it's like you're not understanding that it's made from, you know, it's made from iodine and it's made from, that it's, it's taken out of the blood and it's made from a, a protein. And, you know, they throw it into the middle, the colloid, and they mix it up and it eventually becomes T3 and T4. And then that follicle cell, follicular cell, will grab the T3 and T4 and put it back out into the blood. Hey, Professor Klaus. Yeah. Can you repeat that thyroid hormones question? Uh, I couldn't hear you. Yeah. Um, how are thyroid hormones made? Thank you. I like that. That's a good enough question. Um, so let me recap the recap. Possible, I'm not going to use all of them, but possible larger questions. Um, how are thyroid hormones made? Number one. Number two, that's not going to be a big question. Number two, um, renin angiotensin. Number three, how do steroids work? You know, what do they do? 
Number four. Uh, yeah, I'll put it in. Because it's an important one, epi. It's something that we're going to talk about a lot. Number four. Number five, pancreatic hormones. And number six, that's a small one. Number seven. And lastly, nope, not that. Stay away from that. Oh, yeah, that one, number eight. So I have eight possible things that I can ask, like big questions on. And I'll probably make those first. And then if there's any points left, I'll probably fill them in. So I, I'm thinking right now, I'm thinking it's going to be like a half and half, right? So maybe I'll ask five questions, like bigger questions. And then that would, and then, I don't know, ask some multiple choice. I mean, really the points, the points are, mo most of the points are coming from the essay type of questions. I'm going to put more time on because it's going to be larger. So um, I don't know how long, it's going to be at least an hour. If It'll be an hour and if I can use, um, if I can use um, a lockdown browser, then I'll make it unlimited, like four hours or something. I don't know. Right. So um, I'll know more about that in the next day or two. But you've got the questions. You've got the 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 five the five like uh, big questions. Well, there's eight, but I'm going to take like five of them. Right. So if you study those. And if that's the only ones you got right, you would definitely probably get your, definitely probably, you would most likely get all the, you know, pass. Definitely enough to pass, right? Maybe not enough to get the A. But, all right. Do you all have any other questions? My well, name well, Mr. Klaus, will you send us these uh, slides, the PowerPoint slides to look over? Yeah. I'll put the slides in a present in a um yeah I'll be over in a minute I'll put the slides in a um a, a, an announcement I'll attach it to the announcement I'll put this recording over on pages Does anyone else have any questions I didn't get to yours, Ken. So white blood cell high is bacterial infection. Depend, there's five different types of white blood cells. So, uh, you know, the bacterial infection would be high neutrophil. There's five different white blood cells. Low means something also, but I just didn't put it. You don't have to know it for the test. Thank you guys. Um, it'll go up Friday. Remember, this one's dropping off Monday before class. So Monday at five. You gotta take it by Monday at five. It's gonna drop off after that. So I'm not leaving it up till Tuesday midnight. Monday at five, so that we can go over it in Monday's class. So I'll put it up Thursday night at midnight and it'll drop off um, Monday right before, you know, five o'clock. And let me know if you have any questions, and I will uh, see you guys on Monday. Thank you. Ooh. Thanks, guys. Yeah, hit. Well, you know what? I just, I see all you on here. Unless you're on a phone, you don't have to hit present i'm sorry because i can see all of you guys but there's two of you on the phone so just i think you might have already let me know so all right have a great weekend you too thanks don't go anywhere
and stuff. 